Hi, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the 1882 Foundation Symposium 8. Uh, greetings from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, I am Hong Yan Ying, a PhD candidate and lecturer in architecture at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. I'm co-chairing this year's symposium with Wei Gan, a PhD candidate in anthropology at Princeton University, and Linda Wen, a recent graduate from Georgetown University. I hope you all are doing well, and thank you so much for joining us today. We have three wonderful sessions planned ahead. Before we get into today's session, how do museums best serve communities in times of change? I would like to start with a little formality, introducing some housekeeping rules. Anytime during the session, we ask our audience to mute their microphones to minimize potential disruption. If you have questions during the session, please use the chat function by cl clicking the Zoom bottom bar chat. Our session assistant, Julia Lin, will collect all the questions and forward them to our session moderator. Audience are invited to turn on their cameras and microphones during the Q&A session. And finally, with great pleasure, I'd like to turn the table to Executive Director of the 1882 Foundation, Ted Gong, to give an overview of this year's symposium. Mike. Oh, thank you, everyone, and welcome to, uh, to this session. Uh, good afternoon to all of you, or good evening, depending upon where you're calling in from. You know, this has certainly been a especially busy APA Heritage Month. And if you are anything like me, you're beginning to feel zoomed out. So I'm glad you have pulled yourself together to join us in this uh, final cap to the Heritage Month. This is the first of three consecutive webinars examining why and how we approach public education on Chinese American heritage and history, and by extension about Asian American experience. Um, I am the executive director of 1882 Foundation, and the foundation was formed almost 10 years ago after a grassroots campaign to have Congress apologize for the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. We succeeded in getting the Senate and the House in 2011 and 2012 to unanimously pass resolutions of regret and to condemn the Chinese exclusion laws and to reaffirm their responsibility to protect the civil rights of all people in the United States. Five community and civil rights organizations did this. They were the Chinese American Citizens Alliance, the National Council of Chinese Americans, Japanese American Citizens League, Committee 100, and the OCA Asian American Advocates, plus the law firm of Covington and Burling. From that effort, the 1882 Foundation emerged now the foundation, foundation is a 501c3 organization that seeks to broaden awareness and understanding of the history and continuing and the continuing significance consequences of the Chinese Exclusion Act. We do this through three initiatives. Talk Story, which, revolve, which revolve, revolves around uncovering and preserving oral histories and story sites curriculum and lesson plans, which deals with developing educational material and teacher training up to the 12th grade, and the 1882 Symposium, which is an annual effort to bring museums, historical societies, and other stakeholders together to encourage their collaboration and best practices. The symposium was intended to be small. We purposely organized them to avoid the common structure and formality of such conferences as those organized annually by AAAS or biannually by API HIP. And we purposely did not rotate the symposium venue out of Washington, DC, because we wanted to establish an expectation among participants that they could continuously reinforce contacts with DC-based government and lobbying agencies. Our goal from our first symposium Symposium One, which was launched in the seminar room of the Smithsonian's APA programs office under Franklin Odo, was to build collaborations and to share exhibits, programs, and material. We also understood and we sought to learn how exhibition and programs were increasingly being digitized so that the sharing could be facilitated and relationships could be strengthened. And we believe that continuous regular interactions through the small symposium format will build the trust and develop the exchanges that would form the network that was discussed two years ago 
at a gathering organized by Hoyt Zia and Doug Chan at CHSA in San Francisco. Only our vision was slightly larger because other than museums, we sought to include educators from public schools, stakeholders such as from National Archives, INS, US uh, CIS Immigration, La Historian, Library of Congress, Park and Forest Services, and others. The second gathering of the network was to be hosted by MOCA in New York last year, but the fire there caused the rethinking that the network joined the annual symposium in DC, which was being prepared for May. This was the original Symposium 8. Uh, preparations were advanced with NARA to provide the meeting venue at its downtown office, but COVID inter intervened and the symposium was first postponed because at that time we thought the COVID restrictions wouldn't last more than three months and then they were canceled. So I'm very happy that this opening sessions includes Tang Chamaturis, who will lead us off with Nancy Mossback and Herb Tam from MOCA and a number of good friends and colleagues to continue where we had left last year. I think this would be a great session. Uh, as one panelist mentioned in our prep meetings, it feels like the right time to examine fundamental, fundamental questions of purposes and processes. Certainly the year of coping with COVID has been mentally exhausting and has challenged us all to examine our assumptions of what we do and how we do it. I think also the events of this year between when we formulated our symposium topics in May last year and when we have had to self-reflect on the Black Lives Matter movement and the Atlanta killings have added urgency to us to understand how our programs are relevant to the community we want to reach or to reach us. I think Tung's opening remarks in the theme of community-centric, community-centric designs and creation of, curation of artifacts and stories is more meaningful now than we had this conversation over tea at the Buildings Museum uh, at, the, at the old, Smithsonian's Museum's coffee shop before the pandemic a year ago. I think also the year of coping with COVID has accelerated technological and digital trends and working relationships and our outreach efforts, history and places, school programs and museum layouts. Ed to porn from Angel Island, his discussion and his panel, panel, panelists will be richer because what we, of what we have experimented with and our experience allows us to, do, to discuss more confidently what we might expect looking forward into years ahead, no longer hampered by COVID, but enhanced by what we learned from coping it, coping with it. And I wanna close and return the program to Hong Yen by making early but final comments about the concept of the 1882 symposium. So indulge me for half a minute because this is probably my last symposium, my sort of use by date is coming up. And you know, the symposium has always sought to conclude each symposium with a commitment to complete a goal or a milestone. We call it a milestone to be achieved during the year before next year's symposium. This shared goal will serve to strengthen the collaboration. Between Symposium 6 and Symposium 7, we had the 50 Objects Project that contributed to the Tenement Museum's your Story, Our Story project, which then contributed to MOCA's exhibit featuring Chinatown organizations from around the country. I had a conversation with a curator from the China Alley Museum in Hanford, and she had, had, had expressed how encouraging it was for her that a big museum in New York should have reached out to her to contribute to the larger whole. She felt included, I'm sure, Herb Tam's ability to tell the story in New York was enhanced because of this contribution from Hanford. And hope that we continue setting milestones and I would suggest that the network and the symposium join together to produce symposium nine and 10 and all those other Roman numerals that follow. So thank you for this opportunity to say these few things and I return back to Hong Yen. Thank you. Ted, uh, I'm just going to transfer the table to Tang directly. Thanks. Thank you, Hong Yan, and hi, everybody. Um, let me share screen with you all. Yeah. 
Can you see my screen? Can I say, someone say something or thumbs up? Yep, great, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank, thank Ted Gong and the 1882 Foundation Group for inviting me here today um, and for making this convening possible. I know Ted, you said that you know this symposium started out as a small intimate conversation in a conference room. I don't know who else is on the call today, but I, when I glanced through the audience today, I saw people from London, Argentina, Puerto Rico, and maybe my friends in Malaysia and, and Thailand are awake. Um, there might be someone calling in from there as well. So I think today let's hope for an intimate global conversation about something we all care about. Um, and also I wanna thank 1882 Foundation for your work. Um, your work actually has been an inspiration behind what I'm sharing with you today. I appreciate what you do for the AAPI community here in Washington DC area and also with the, our network around the country as well. Um, and welcome everyone, including our colleague from ICOM US. Um, this ties this conversation tie tie in nicely with the ongoing debate and discussion on museum definition and what can museum do for for people. So I hope everyone is healthy and 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 well where you are. So let's start the conversation. Um, today I'm gonna um, let us take a break and go to somewhere far away. My name is Teng Shum Shumras and this is where I'm from. I like to show this picture to people to describe where I was born and spent my younger years um, growing up. And what is interesting about this photo for me is that if you cover the top part, you see the old part of Bangkok. And if you cover the bottom, you see the top. And when you open up both the top and the bottom, you see a mix of old and new. And you're trying to figure out, okay, where exactly is the Bangkok that I identify with or anyone identify with? And it's a bit of both. And I think one of the things, the themes that you will see here today is about like how, how can we as people move forward um, into the future with our cultural heritage and yet all the challenges of, and, and opportunities of, of today and tomorrow. So that's gonna be the theme today. So let's keep going. So as a sort of a guiding questions for today's conversation, I'd like us, to, I know some of you are from the museum field and some of you may not be, um, but I, I'd like us to kind of have these three questions in mind as we're going to actually a trip around the world. Um, and, and the three questions are, how can we foster sustainable change and keep communities vibrant, resilient, and well? Second question is, what role does culture play in community well-being? And the third question is, how can museums as cultural hubs play an active role in this effort? So take a moment and take these questions into the back of your mind and, and we'll continue with our journey today. We'll start a journey with this little building in the city of Georgetown in Penang, Malaysia. Um, and I'm gonna ask you to do this question. Unfortunately, we can't interact live or raise our hand, but I'm gonna ask you this question. You see this building. The question is, if you had a million dollars, what would you do with it? I'll give you a moment and I'll give you additional information. If I give you the context that this building is in a very historically significant neighborhood. It is in the UNESCO World Heritage Zone in a historic city that is multi-ethnic, multi-linguistic, multi-religious. It's been a maritime center in Southeast Asia for at least 500 years. And, and for those foodies um, in the group, um, it has one of the most famous chendol, which is a dessert in Southeast Asia, right next to it, practically a stone throw away from this building. It's a famous site for, for a local concrete ghost festival. And it is also at the threat of redevelopment. So if you had a million dollars, what would you do with this money? Then I'm gonna add more context for you. 
people who live here actually have limited access to financing to own homes. Rents are going up for both residents and businesses. Um, amenities are limited. Some of the back alleys don't even have lighting. Um, there's a decline in local economy. People start to migrate to the suburb. The one local school two blocks from here is shut down. And there's an overall social decline in this community. It's about you know, a couple blocks wide and a couple blocks long. It's not that big of a neighborhood. So one more time, if you had a million dollars, what would you do? Well, I ponder a lot um, over this building because I had the opportunity to travel there and um, we'd be part of a group that study conservation of old neighborhoods in Southeast Asia. I'm, I'm very passionate about that topic. As you know, I'm from Bangkok and I've seen Bangkok leap, grow and leap and bow in the last couple decades. And I, I see the loss of the old Bangkok as well as the, the exciting new part of Bangkok. And I, I'm kind of curious if I had the money to do this, what would I do? And I start to, to, to look around, ask questions. And a lot of people tell me, oh, we will spend the money to save this building. And I said, what about the people, the people that make this building alive, the people that keep the neighborhood alive? And, and that was a, a, a little bit of a dilemma between the people that, the, among the people that we were having conversation with, because a lot of us coming from a cultural sector, our instinct is to go for a conservation of objects or a built heritage or even intangible heritage. But sometimes the people who keep the tradition or the practice to keep that, those places, objects and practices alive are sort of secondary. So I thought about it and I said, well, how can we think about this differently? So I did some research and just for your background, I only have worked in the museum for the last almost 10 years, but pre prior to that, I spent a lot of my time in the disaster relief board. I used to work for the Red Cross and I respond to, a, we, we were part of teams that respond to a lot of disasters. So we were really, um, into the community resilience framework. And so I thought for a second about it and I said, what if we flip the model? We change it from a concept of heritage conservation to cultural sustainability. It's less about keeping things as it is, but allowing things to grow, but grow in a way that change doesn't kill all the good things. How can we shift from the focus on heritage objects or intangible heritage to communities and their needs? How can we make culture something that is so part of the basic need? Can, can, can culture be considered part of things that we need like food or shelter as opposed to something that is so far away? And how can we think about culture or heritage as something to be preserved at, instead of something that evolved with us as our needs and our community needs evolve. And so there's so many things going on and you know, we start looking at what, what does it mean to bring together different disciplines, conservation, architectural conservation, anthropology, economics. Have we thought about bringing in economics and, and, and the, the principle around international development into cultural conservation? So this is becoming more of an interdisciplinary uh, conversation and action rather than something that is field specific. And when we talk about people, can we keep that ownership and the power of decision-making and action taking to the people themselves with all of us who are interested in helping be helpers, but not necessarily someone who dictate what they need to do. So with all of that, um, I kind of sketched something out and it starts with, you know, people and who they are and where they live, right? So it's people and their contact, you know, what, what are their values? What are important to them as communities? And what are the contexts around them? Whether it's human context, physical, political, economic, social environment, and definitely culture. And I asked the question, 
if people are fine where they are, what happened? Well, usually external shock happened. And when I start working on this framework, it was back in 2018. Um, and you know, the idea of having a pandemic or kind of major racial reckoning in the United States were, were not kind of things that I would imagine to be our external shock, but here we are. But when I usually, what I usually talk about external shock in this context would be a disaster. You know, what if, you know, a hurricane or a tsunami blow to your community? What happened? How, that, how does that impact your context and your well-being? Or it doesn't have to be a bad or negative external shock. It could be also economic boom. You know, um, what if something happened really that, that drive the economic growth in your community and, and that, that start to change the dynamic of who you are and where you live? What does it mean? So if we really put the agency and ability to think about what's important to the people who live in those communities, um, it's up to them to identify what problems they're facing, what might be impacting who they are and where they live, how, how well they're living. How would they prioritize what their needs are and start working towards the solutions of what, what, what needs to happen? and then take action. And the end goal is you know, to live happily, to, to, be, to make sure that you know, whatever happens, you come back to where you were in terms of well-being or even improved it, right? And what is nice about this concept is that if people invest in their community, they, they, their well-being um, is a needs are met, um, they will, have a strong sense of identity and belonging and become a stu good steward of who they are and where they belong. And then they reinvest back to the communities. So in a way, in an economics term, this is basically creating incentive for people to take care of themselves. But of course, you can't do it alone. And so if you look at, um, the same model, but from the top down with the community well-being in the center, there's also um, a network of stakeholders or partners in the ecosystem to also help enable the decision-making and solution within the community. And museum is one of them. And today, you know, I'd like to kind of walk you through some of the example where museum can play that role. So to put the model together, so we start with people, who they are and where they live, and the process of you know trying to regain their um, well-being um, when something happened to the community, and then that cannot happen alone. So we have a, a, a green ring in this in this uh, diagram to show that it, it takes a, an ecosystem to make that happen. So you're like, okay, nice picture. So proof of this can work, right? And we'll get there. So before we get to um, some of the data, um, the question is if museum were to be part of this conversation, what can museum do? And when I, I mention museum, it's not just museum, but I think the overall cultural institution communities, including even public libraries can also be part of this conversation. And I, I think some of the key questions to be asked in terms of implementation would be, is service to community explicit in, in your museum vision, mission, guiding principles, mandate, and organizational culture? Is being part of that green ring to support a community really there? If it is, does the leadership of the museum, including board and management, emphasize the commitment to an investment in the service to communities. And if all of this is done, then there are some existing tools out there that can really help us. I think you're aware of uh, the SWOT analysis um, framework, strength, weakness, opportunities, and threat. We use that all the time in both uh, the business sector and also in um, nonprofit sector. And we can apply that same tool in, in this conversation. 
you know, how can we um, use service community as part of, of, of the, the SWOT analysis? What can your museum uniquely do to con contribute to help address the needs and challenges of the community? Where and with whom in the ecosystem can you work with? Museum cannot work alone, but how can, who can we partner with to make that happen? And last but not least, I think this framework doesn't take away from the importance of collections and research, but the question is, what can we do more? How can we bring balance between the object and for whom they are? So that what we do become relevant to the community if you would like to observe. So, I've talked a lot and you know, so far it's a lot of words. Um, and the question is, can I prove this? You know, as a trained economist and someone who went to business school, I love data. And I struggle with this, this framework because data in the cultural sector is hard to come by. You know, if I were to answer the question, what would you do to that $1 million to that building? If data wasn't an issue, I would be running return on investment analysis and show something, but I don't have that information. What I have is a lot of good work that has been done by people, many people on this call actually, um, that show that it can be done. That community centric model can be adapted and, and can work in different contexts. You know, it just takes that vision and commitment and investment from the top down in your organization and your partnership with everyone else in the community um, to make it happen. And while the process can be messy and difficult, it's all worth it. And there are four case studies that I used to use in the past um, to talk about this. And they start with Ted and his work um, and 1882 Foundation and other um, organization, including the Smithsonian uh, Anarchistic Community Museum, that, that really work um, around Chinatown in DC at the neighborhood level. Um, in Oakland, um, the Oakland Museum of California has done some great work um, in the city level um, to really bring people in. If, if you from Oakland have been to Oakland, you may have heard of their Friday events where the community just come and hang out at the museum because it's their space. Um, at the country level, I had the opportunity to work with the Purple Folk Life and Cultural Heritage at the Smithsonian to do a project in Bhutan where a national museum, a national level museum, the Royal Textile Academy of Bhutan worked in an interesting way where um, they aligned their um, public program and education strategy um, to the country's social and economic development plan. So that's an interesting one where um, we are trying to figure out how to use culture to be part of STEM and career development pathway for students. And last but not least, this model also could work from an example from the Museum on Main Street programs um, done by um, the Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibit, Exhibition or Service or Sites that shows that, you know, across the um, rural communities in the United States for the last 25 years, site partners with um, state humanity councils to actually deliver content to the rural communities and activate conversation and action within those communities using something that could fit this model. Um, but today I like to show you something actually that I'm really excited about um, where instead of going back and look through time and see what example might fit this model, that is a project in Thailand right now that adopt this model and said, let's figure out how to design a project with community and for the community using this model for, for their own well-being. So it's the first time that we actually take the model and actually decide something and building it as we go. Um, and the work is work in progress. So I might not have all the information to share with you. I think we have enough to kind of show what exciting thing is happening. So if you would like to join me, I'd like to invite you to travel to Thailand for a few minutes. Um, and 
I don't know if any of you have been to Thailand. You might have been to Bangkok. You might have heard of big city like Chiang Mai in the north of Phuket in the south. But today we're going to go to the Macham district. So it's in the province of Chiang Mai in the north of Thailand. And you can see in the map there, it's the, the shaded gray area. It, it's next to um, the tallest mountain in Thailand and it's in the north. Um, and so let me show you um, what it looks like. Um, that area is known for the beautiful fog. So a lot of people travel there just to see the sea of fog, either at, at dawn or at dusk. And people come out and it's really beautiful. You can see this photo. Unfortunately, it's also known for smog. Um, and the picture that I'm showing you right now, it might look like it was our focus, but that's not our focus. It's just the haze from the smog. And that haze is due to slash and burn farming practice. And unfortunately, that's the way to do agriculture there for many reasons, one of which is that um, the land is pretty arid and doesn't have a lot of fertilization. And so sometimes the easiest way to grow food is to um, cut down the tree and grow. Unfortunately, that, that also requires burning of the, the topsoil and you end up with the smog. And where does the smog go? It actually goes into the valley where the city of Chiang Mai is. And that not only caused environmental harm, but it also causes some tension between those in the valley and those up in the mountains. Um, there's a lot of um, up to read upon online. I don't have statistics to show you. Unfortunately, there's no collection of data at that level, but um, there's a lot of articles to be read about you Google Matcham and you see stories about um, a lot of inequity issues and environmental injustices are happening in that area. So also I want to show you this. Um, this is an, a typical road in the area. Imagine that you know you live in this mountain and this is how you have to get to work, to school, go, go get food, grocery shopping. Um, that's, that's your commute. Um, and for the little kids here in this photo, to go to school, it means you actually have to leave home and be in a boarding school even at a young age. Well, I don't want to keep us on these grim photos because in fact, Metjam is actually a vibrant place full with festival and peoples and peoples in plural because there are at least seven or eight um, ethnic groups who live there um, and they all have rich culture um, and craft practices and even the young people in the middle picture if you didn't know that that picture was taken in Thailand you might have thought that this might have been from any city in the United States so so what does it all add up to so I'll let you take a moment to kind of take in what Metam is like as a place. I can't see you, so I don't know what your reaction is, but when I see this picture, I'm like, huh, this is interesting. It's a place where one photo cannot describe it in justice and that I think my collage here doesn't even tell the full story of a little place in the north of Thailand. So I don't know if um, Suvari is on the call today. I know it's 4.30 over there in the morning, but she is the woman with the black garment in the bottom left of this slide. She, make, she is a director of the Chiang Mai city um, art and cultural center in the city of Chiang Mai down in the valley. And she made this observation to me um, 
I met her in Malaysia. So um, that's the first building you saw on, on this trip that we're taking together. And she made a comment to me that, you know, for whatever uh, is lacking in Mecham, if we see those things, either economic, whether they're economic, social, or environmental deficits, they are outweighed by the cultural assets. She said, I can't measure this. I, I work here long enough to know that if you can quantify it, the asset is greater than the deficit. The question is, how do we un unlock that cultural asset and make the playing field more equal between those who live up in the mountains with less access to education and other modern, modern infrastructure to the people who live in the valley with good schools and good career opportunities and good economics opportunities. So we decided that let, let's, let's ask the people. There, there are people who actually left their villages, went on to get education, make a career and then come back. And we asked them this question, what is success and happiness to you? So I'm about you to walk you through the story of the project that is happening. And I'm going to remind us that, you know, we have the model we're trying to, to, to use for this. So on the right corner of the slide and the following slide, you see that I call out a different part of the model. So we are starting with the orange part, which is the tip, which is the well-being part. And at the micro level, we want to know what, what the intention of people are. What makes them happy? So we ask the question, what's, what is success and happiness to you? And these are some of the responses that we got. I'm not gonna read them all. I'll let you read them. Um, I'll let you reflect on them a little bit, um, but I'm gonna just read one of them, which is the first one on the left. And the answer was, let me start with happiness. First, happiness is to do with what I like. Second, happiness to be with loved ones. In Matcham, I do what I like and I am with my mom. So I'm a native speaker of the Thai language, but my translation um, skill is not that great. So I might have lost some sentiment when I translated these, but I hope you kind of get the feel of how important it is for how important is identity and, and sense of belonging really matters for the people that highly share that thought with us. Also, interestingly, the question was, what is success and happiness to you? None of them remember to answer the question on success. They kind of started with it or not at all, but then everyone talked about happiness. So I thought that was an interesting take as well from, from what they did not say. So at the micro level, people actually want to be here and their well-being and their happiness in the community is so important to them. So, so keep that in the back of your mind. Because the flip, the, another side of this is a um, more of a macro level. So take step away a little bit from the, the villages I show you. And we're now looking at Thailand's socioeconomic development plan. It's called Thailand 4.0. And for those of you who do not know much about Thailand, so, you know, we started off as an agriculture-based country and then we moved into um, light industry and then heavy industry and then, so those are the, the version one, version two, and version three, and now we're moving to version four and the question is, you know, in the next 20, 30 years, when we get to version four, when Thailand becomes a place of creativity, innovation, you know, what, what, what is Thailand like? You know, what, does it, what is it like to have smart industry, smart city and smart people, right? So in the backdrop, while we're hearing from, from people who live in a small place talking about their, their hopes and dreams and what is important to them, we also listening to the the big economic and 
social development context of the bigger place that this small place fit under. So with those two end of the spectrum with the micro and the macro, we start asking the question, okay, so if that the intended future of people at their individual level is to be with their loved ones and do what they can do as, as proud people. And at the mi mi macro level, the country wants you to, you know, be part of the smart economy. How do we get there? So we are now getting the, the gray area that, you know, get from Majam as you learn from those little photos to where people intended to be. And now the process of getting from here to there, what does it look like? So a few of us asked this question and the few of us here include um, three, three groups of people. One is the um, Chiang Mai City Art and Cultural Center um, one is a project called Kontai 4.0. Kontai means Thai people. So this is sort of the um, human capital aspect of what it means to develop people for the nation. And it's a national research program out of Chiang Mai University, which is one of the top universities in Thailand. And the last logo you see there, SWU, is a network of education um, institutions in Thailand is a, is, a, is a network of universities that train teachers, train educators. Um, they also have lab schools um, where, you know, a new, new innovation in education, curriculum development, professional development happen. I happen to have gone to one of those schools as a child. Um, my mom um, taught there and my parents both graduated from the system. So, so I know the system quite well. And, and one of the school, the lab school is actually in the Macham community um, and is there to serve um, indigenous um, children who, who are in boarding school that you saw earlier. So they got together and they asked the question, okay, so we have students at a young age. We want them to grow and love Macham like the adults are today. We also need to get them ready for the future of the country as the economic development plan said. How do we engage, equip them to explore, think, act, and thrive in this changing world and impressing them with a sense of commitment to an ownership of their community and then take action to reinvest in their shared future? So in a more tactical museum-based question, because um, one of our key partner is, is a museum, a city museum, how can museum as civ civic and gathering place and you know, a place of education practices help unlock the cultural asset and contribute to whole child development that will feed to the first question that we asked? And this is where um, COVID it's just causing us a lot of trouble. So um, I have been, um, I'm grateful that I've been identified to help um, and be part of this project under Fulbright Specialist Program and COVID put a stop to it. So um, I didn't get to go and, and this was decided to be a project back last, late last spring. It was supposed to tie to school year over there so that kids have time to you know, do some project that is museum based. It will be some oral history project for those edu uh, museum educators on the call today. We'll do a lot of project zero work, you know, see thing wonder and all those things. Um, and we were gonna build a program from scratch and COVID happened and I said, okay, I can't go. Well, one thing that I learned from this is when you are invited in, and the community actually embrace whatever they want to do. You're just a guest and you don't need to be there for them to want to do their thing. So in the last many months, the project team actually form and start to engage kids. And you see pictures from them visiting museums in, in the city of Chiang Mai during the design week. Um, talking to curators and other practitioners, getting inspired by 
objects and learning different ways of learning. They came back to their school and they start to kind of practice, um, you know, storytelling, um, oral history, how do you collect stories? How do you retell story? How do you use your voice to tell story about who you are and where you live? So these photos on the right side is basically, I think the prep session before they go off on their summer vacation, which started in end of March in internet and that's how school year works. So they're all actually leaving their boarding school and they're going back to their villages and they're gonna start collecting stories. And hopefully when they get back, um, there will be an exhibition about them and the story they want to share. And the exhibition will be in the city, interestingly enough, to, to, to share the story and the beautiful things that happen um, up in the mountain. And then they will travel this exhibition back to their school so that they can also celebrate their story with their community. So, Unfortunately, I don't have more photos to share with you. It's happening, the kids are at home. Um, but you know, this work, as I said, is, is part of the ecosystem. So what is that green link ring in, in the model look like? So you start with the museum and the, the research project. So um, the Chiang Mai City um, Art and Cultural Center and um, Kuantai 4.0 project. Both are backed up by their home organization. So the museum is part of the municipality government and um, the research project is part of the economics department of Chiang Mai University. The school, the school is actually one of the few schools we want to pilot the project, but because of COVID, we kind of have to scale it down. So it's only one school for now and it's supported by also the university. And just a fun fact for, for those of us uh, who might be interested in math on this call, the logo of the school and university, the little graph there is, um, it's an exponential graph. And it's y to e to the power of x. And what it means is that as human being, you start, you can start low, but you never start at zero. You start above zero and all you can do is grow. So I thought it's kind of fitting that our school partner has that, that vision in mind. Obviously we have support from Fulbright and also the US Embassy in Bangkok. Both, of, both organizations provided funding for this project. And last but not least, the project team is actually made up of people from, from the Netcham community and I'll, I'll, I'll show, introduce you to them in a minute. But without them, we would not be able to get in and do the work. And those are some of the meetings that happened um, throughout the last year when travel was um, um, feasible within Thailand. Obviously, I'm sitting here talking to you and looking at this from Rockville, Maryland. So it's, it's kind of amazing to just know that it's happening. So the last part of the model is, you know, I, don't, I just don't want us to forget that this whole journey is about applying a model. And the last part of the model is that it reca we recapitalize people's sense of identity and belonging back to the community. And this is a part of recapitalization. If you remember the bubbles, the quotes that I showed you in a couple of slides ago on people who share them, share with us their, their, their hopes and dreams and what happiness means to them, these are the five. Um, we have everyone from artists to small business owner to a pharmacist who is now uh, running her own business back in the community. Um, so, I just want to put faces to the voices. These are the two teachers that are telling us why they chose to teach here and not elsewhere. 
and where where they they stick with this school, these schools in this community where resources might be hard to come by. Why is it important to, for them to be here? And the last two, um, the one, the gentleman with the coffee beans, um, he actually owns a, uh, he's a social entrepreneur. He's from um, one of the communities in the mountain. Um, he runs a um, fair trade coffee um, business now and um, bring um, economic growth into the community. And then the gentleman in the red um, shirt in the center of the last photo is the project director who actually has a doctoral degree in education, but he's also from the community and he agreed to serve as a project director so he can relate to the kids and the teachers in the community directly on behalf of us. So these people want to be here and they are helping us figure out how to get from students and youth from where they are today and unlock the cultural asset that they have today so that they can get to the intended future of, you know, how can you be happy in the world that is changing? So to sum it all up in a easy to follow diagram of the model, it looks like this. I'm not gonna read through it, but it's just to show that all of the slides we went through and the picture that we've seen actually before that the model could work and it's being worked on right now. So we started with these three questions. I don't know where you are. I would love to hear where you are <laughs> with them. Um, I know it's a different take on what museums usually do or could do, but it doesn't take away from what you already do and are doing, but it just asks the question a little differently and say, we could do something a little different too. So I'll leave you with this one last thought um, from James Shelton III. He asked this question I thought is so fitting. He said, what are we willing to do to change the system to scale and give people what they need in order to thrive and solve their problems? Well, hopefully we can continue this conversation or work together or share knowledge. Um, if you like um, the paper that I published was in, on this link, I can drop the link on the Zoom chat later as well if you're interested. And let's keep in touch. So with that, I think I'm right on time. So I'm gonna turn the floor back to Hong Yan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tong. Uh, now uh, I will turn the table to Herb Tan, the moderator. Uh, and Herb is the curator and director of exhibitions at the Museum of Chinese in America, MOCA. Uh, Herb will lead a Roundtable discussion following Tang's talk. Um, thank you, Hong Yang, and also thank you, Ted Gong, for uh, you know bringing us together here today, um, not just today, but you know uh, for for many years now. And um, you know it's a really important uh, conversation we're having today about the role of museums in uh, the communities that we serve and. I think Tung's um, presentation, which is really beautiful, um, I think gives us a lot to think about and a lot to talk about. So I just want to get um, right into it uh, with the discussion, but first um, some business and uh, some introductions. Um, and I want to start with uh, introductions of my um, sort of fellow, fellow panelists uh, and then allow them to uh, introduce the work they're, that they're doing in their organizations. So if, uh, when I introduce you, if you could sort of raise your hand to give a wave uh, so that people know who you are, that'd be great. Um, so Nancy Yao Mosbach, uh, president of the museum where I work, Museum of Chinese in America in New York. Um, Cybel Jones, the chief executive officer of the Society for Experimental Graphic Design. Rachel Schumard, Manager of Public Programs at the Chinese American Museum in Los Angeles. And Michael Chong, um, Executive Director, uh, also of uh, the Chinese American Museum in Los Angeles. 
and last but not least, Jack Chen, Professor and Chair of Public History and Humanities um, at Rutgers University and co-founder of the New York Chinatown History Project, uh, which later became MOCA. So uh, what I'm gonna have each of the panelists do is to, to spend two or three minutes um, talking about their organization, their organization's work. Um, and then at the end of that, then we'll um, have many questions for, for all of you uh, uh, and go through you know, those questions and then um, open it up to audience uh, questions after that. So um, it should be a really lively discussion. I'm looking forward to it. So first, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Nancy at last block for, uh, to talk about MOCA, Nancy. Thanks, Herb. And Herb is uh, my favorite curator in America. Uh, so, uh, but Ted, thank you again for those remarks. And Tang, I really enjoyed um, hearing about uh, your concept framework. And I, I cannot more wholly agree with um, everything that you shared. And I'm thinking a lot as you're sharing, you know, what is the, what is the practical, tactical ways in which one can really do that more fully. Um, so Mocha, I think many of you know us, um, and Jack Chen, of course, is uh, one of our co-founders. Um, he has the ultimate uh, heroes uh, label of being our favorite dumpster diver. Um, and I think we continue in that, in that vein. And we know that, and he knew that it wasn't, it wasn't junk in that, those dumpsters, but valuable things, uh, valuable artifacts, valuable stories, uh, valuable uh, components of our journey. Uh, so Mocha, 41 years old. Uh, many of you know we have uh, one of the largest collections of Chinese American history, as I just referred to, about eight, oh, more than 85,000 items. And many of you have reached out and asked if um, how they're doing. We've been able to retrieve and stabilize 98% of those collections, uh, and they're over at our new site, Mocha Workshop. Um, but one thing I'll just say and, and sort of give you a sense, we still have people who come to the museum. And they look around quizzically, they just wonder like, is this the right place I'm going to? Because there's still a very great sense that this is, should be a museum of Chinese art or Chinese calligraphy or a Qing dynasty vase. And many of us all get that sort of assumption, but you know, we really are very steadfast in, in sort of sharing that we wanna really serve as that US history in New York City. So um, we're reaching about 50,000 people feed through the door in 2019. Uh, and in the last year of virtual programming, we've probably increased our viewership maybe eight to tenfold. Um, and that being all said, still within a very modest budget of a little under $3 million. Uh, so, you know, you see um, we have uh, the space, I'm in it right now, and Herb is about to um, open up a new exhibit on July 15th in our current exhibit space, and we can talk more about that later. But uh, thanks to everyone for all of your support, especially over the last 15 months. Great, thank you, Nancy. Good to see the space. Um, and yes, we are getting ready to reopen July 15th. Excited about that. Um, so next, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Seidel Jones um, of Society for Experimental Graphic Design, Seidel. Great, thank you, Herb. And I had the pleasure of our rehearsal getting to hear Tang's presentation, and I'm just so inspired by his work. So um, I'm sure the conversations will continue um, after today. But I, um, my background is I have about over 35 years of being a principal uh, leading museum exhibition and experience design and, you know, every possible topic, but the things that I'm most passionate about are um, experiences around cultural heritage, social justice, and our history. And recently, just a year ago, I joined SCGD and I'm gonna to try to just quickly see if I can share my screen, um, which is a nonprofit organization. Um, we are a community of interdisciplinary uh, designers. Can everybody see that? I'm just gonna do, are you able to see the screen? Yep. Yep, we can see it. Um, so we're this we're a nonprofit uh, organization, and we are interdisciplinary designers that do everything from um, exhibition design, graphic design, uh, education research, and we're all about connecting people to place. And so, part of my journey um, has been to really take advantage of the opportunity in our methodologies and processes as experienced designers to really put. Uh, people and our end users in the center. And so we uh, do a lot of work around education, conferences, summits, 
Um, we work a lot with students and I think that what I'm most excited about with all the disruption this last year is that we have the opportunity to reinvent and that those of us that are in the practice of cultural institutions and design really can make important and compelling change so that hopefully the next generation of um, don't have to face the same things and, and they actually have a fair voice in how we tell history and who tells that history and what the meaning actually is of our cultural institution. So I'm very excited about um, this conversation and happy to be a part of it. Great, thank you, Saibel. Um, and next, uh, the crew from uh, Chinese American Museum, Rachel Schumard and uh, Michael Strong. Can you talk about the work you're doing um, in LA? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I as you mentioned, I'm Michael Chong, the executive director of the Chinese American Museum. I actually have been with the museum for over 14 years or so, but became the executive director about two years ago. The Chinese American Museum is located in downtown Los Angeles. And as Tang was talking about importance of community and sustaining the history and the culture there, the Chinese American Museum is located in the Garnier building that was constructed in 1890. And it's one of the last main buildings of historic Chinatown. So when we think about the Chinatown of Los Angeles, we think about Chinatown's about four or five blocks away from here. But the museum was purposely put into this um, building to really share the history and the preservation of a story that Los Angeles forget. It was the fact that the Chinese was in Los Angeles since the 1800s and beyond. So uh, the building has always been uh, considered to be the unofficial city hall historic Chinatown. Uh, had uh, this uh, CACA uh, Los Angeles Lodge actually had an office there. And when the museum opened in 2003, it took a lot of work. You know, it, it was about 20 years in the making. So a nonprofit organization, the Friends of the Chinese American Museum, which I'm part of, was fundraising and was trying to get community support for over 20 years. We hosted our History Makers Awards Gala to really raise funds. We continue with this gala now to get, uh, and it's one of our major fundraiser to uh, honor those who support the Chinese American community. And before the museum opened, we were celebrating Chinese America through a Latin festival, raising awareness, the fact that the Chinese American Museum is opening, but the fact that when we think about the birthplace of Los Angeles, we're thinking about um, a diverse location, including the Chinese Americans or within this particular location. And I'm going to pass it over on to uh, my colleague, Rochelle, to talk about the next question. Yes, hello, everyone. So inside the museum, we have several permanent exhibitions and a dedicated space for temporary exhibitions. Journeys, as you see here, tells the story, the history of Chinese in the United States, starting with the California Gold Rush, all the way up to present day. Our origins exhib exhibition continues the story from the formation of New Chinatown in the 1930s to the suburban neighborhoods of the San Gabriel Valley, where many Chinese immigrants began establishing homes in the community in the 1980s. And pictured here is our last um, temporary exhibition prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, The Red Envelope Show, which featured over 200 AAPI artists from across the country to celebrate the Year of the Rat. Our museum serves a diverse population as we are situated in the birthplace of Los Angeles. In addition to exhibitions, we offer school tours and host a variety of public programming to serve and educate the community and touring visitors. Though in-person programming uh, was not permitted over the past year, we have put efforts into staying connected with our community by increasing our online programming. And to learn more about us, you can find us on Facebook at Chinese American Museum, on Instagram at camlet.org, and you can go to our website listed here. Great, thank you, um, Rochelle and Michael. And uh, last, I wanna welcome Jack Chen uh, from Rutgers University. Jack, can you talk about what you're doing over there at Rutgers? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, it's good to see everybody. I, I see a lot of names I know from museum days. Um, and thank you, um, 1882. And thank you, um, uh, also thank you, Herb, very much. Um, uh, a lot of you know me from when I was doing mainly my work in Manhattan, but I've shifted my focus to engage with global warming questions, but also working with 
Black and Indigenous communities. Um, I should maybe give a historical context for that, uh, that really grounds itself in terms of the work I've done. Um, so some of you may know of the work I had done called New York Before Chinatown. And part of that work was looking at someone like George Washington and why was he so obsessed with um, Chinese porcelain ware in the middle of the Revolutionary War, right? And he was desperate to reach his local Chinaman, a British uh, non-Chinese uh, merchant who was trying to provide him with the, the latest um, settings of porcelain that would befit the style of a gentleman. Um, and George Washington, of course, was also a surveyor. And with the Native Americans that I work with today, the Muncie Lenape people, they actually still refer to him as a town destroyer. In other words, by surveying the areas um, that he did, he was actually expanding um, into indigenous uh, lands. And he also, of course, was an owner of 100 more slaves. And um, so I, I tell the story of George Washington because the founding of the nation and as embodied by him actually brought together a set of fundamental social injustices that have to do with dispossession of the lands that had to do with enslavement of uh, and indentureship of not only African and African Americans, Afro-Caribbeans, but also the attempted enslavement of indigenous peoples as well. And that was actually deeply linked in terms of the extraction processes of trying to not only get beaver pelts, uh, but also find things that uh, Asia, but in particular, the China market wanted uh, so that it could gain access to those luxury items that were being produced in the quote unquote Orient. Um, so I bring this up really to say that in this moment of the pandemic, but also in this moment of, um, of, of, of the horrible killings that have been going on, uh, both in terms of uh, anti-Asian violence, but also of course, anti-Black violence and the many other kinds of anti other violences that have been happening over the past number of years, there's an intertwined history for that. And um, so the social justice questions, I think deeply interconnect uh, Asian Americans, Chinese through the exclusion laws, but also general kind of anti-Chinese uh, racism that continues. And uh, the social justice issues that seem to be more linked to, oh, African Americans or this group or that group. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to just say that my work right now is trying to understand these, the contemporary interconnections and why in some ways they get in the way of dealing with global warming in the United States, especially. Uh, a lot of people blame China for not only COVID, but also why um, the United States uh, is not able to get more solar panels because they're built more cheaply in China. All these kinds of issues are intertwined with various kinds of scapegoating and not really taking responsibility for this nation's historical um, uh, kind of uh, uh, climate injustices um, that it has. And um, so for me to deal with contemporary questions of global warming, but also contemporary issues of social justice, we do have to go into that deep colonial history and really grapple with that. So for me, that gives um, in some ways an added urgency, but also an added grounding um, for what we're dealing with now and how with global warming, the, the, the clock is ticking in terms of how much time do we really have to deal with it. Um, we're already in the midst of horrendous uh, increased um, huge uh, impact events uh, of which COVID is actually a part in part an expression of in terms of development into quote unquote wild areas and the cross species diseases that are that are that are making us very vulnerable. Um, so I guess I thought I would just kind of raise that 1882 part of this question because the 1882 exclusion was not simply an isolated instance that only had to do with Chinese, but really was linked to the dispossession and enslavement, but also leading up to uh, the international eugenics movement of which New York was actually at the center of. So this kind of systematic othering is something that is deeply ingrained in the um, US culture, I would say. So let me just stop there, but that's my latest work. Great, thanks, um, Jack. And that's a, <clears throat> I think a good segue into uh, you know, starting a conversation about um, 
museums and the communities that uh, museums serve. And um, it sort of brings me back to um, a theme of uh, Tong's presentation around, um, you know, happiness. And certainly this moment, when we think about this moment, it's, um, you know, happiness is maybe a difficult word to, it may, may not be the first word that comes up because of what's been happening over the past year. Certainly for museums, it's been a tough time. You know, uh, many have been closed for a while. Many are still closed. Um, and there are different expectations uh, on museums, uh, you know, since uh, what happened last year, the killings of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery, um, Breonna Taylor uh, have brought up a lot of issues around uh, how museums can be part of social justice, racial justice movements. Um, and of course, you know, all the violence that we've been mentioning um, where Asian Americans are targets. Um, you know, happiness is just not a word that comes to mind so easily. So I wonder if um, for the panelists, you know, I'm sure this has going, been going through your mind in terms of what your organizations can do um, to respond to a very complex um, cultural and political moment. So, you know, I wonder what has been going through your mind about, you know, what's, what's possible for, for museums um, in this moment. And I'll just open it up and, you know, if you have a response to that, you know, please chime in. Herb, we're a polite group. You should just call on someone. Well, Nancy, you spoke up, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, please. I did. Uh, you know, I, I'll try to keep um, succinct. Um, you know, I think we all struggle with um, the inability for maybe some perception to see the layeredness and the nuance in, 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 in all groups, in all people. And you know we've been giving, we've had the good fortune of being able to speak to a lot of different groups, especially in the last eight weeks in particular, um, as many corporates, um, parent associations, schools, other organizations, Pfizer, you know, have really asked for us to chat with them about um, what we think about the current climate, um, and questions around um, social justice, allyship always surface, and at the same time, there is still a huge bridge um, to understanding. And I, and I find that because we even our textbooks and we haven't been able to redefine the narrative just around the first 180 years of Chinese Americanness and the journey, what we're still struggling with is post 65. Um, and you know, I think all this data we all know very well. You know, we had an eightfold increase in the Chinese American population after 1965. So, um, you know, we had 300,000 international students from China in 2019. Um, we have 80,000, you know, families with children from China, 80,000 adoptees, and now it's a third, three, three, child, three child policy. There's so much has changed, particularly in the last 40 years, but because we have still grappling with having people understand the, the origin story, the, the first hundred years, the first 50 years, the first, you know, you know several decades, there's, a, there's this interesting sense of this, the, the, the word community I always struggle with because we are, we're dealing with so many different communities. And in some ways, the irony for me is that when we use the word community, it's actually limiting. Um, and it often, at least in the MOCA's context in New York City, it often refers to Chinatown. Um, and, and I struggle with that because it becomes in this odd way, exclusionary. Um, and what we really want to try to make space for is for you know, all these groups and really to see individuals and, and their passion and their purpose um, and their journey in, in this space. But there's so much um, around what needs to even happen from, the, from, from 220 years ago, let alone the last 40 years, uh, that we are so behind. And that's why Herb and I often talk about the rest of the team at MOCA, which still remains, you know, 12 people at this point, to the urgency around what we want to do and like responding to the idea of museums and, and our role I feel like you know, often people think of museums as passive organizations or institutions or structures or buildings, and there's nothing more um, there's nothing more opposing to us in that view than than the, the, not the passivity, the aggressiveness, the urgency around 
what we feel that we need to do. And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing how we, we might all feel. Uh, we cannot work quickly enough. Um, and that's often how, how we feel. But we want to make sure that we are mission focused um, and not always getting pulled by gravitational elements. Yeah, I'd like to add to what Nasser is saying. I think about museums. I think right now, especially with everything that's going on, there's like this reflection about what museum is and what we can do. Um, you know, I was the educator for quite some time pre-pandemic, and a lot of the conversation we had at the museum was, you know, we want to share our history so it won't be repeated again. But as we've seen, what we live in now is being repeated. So as a museum, uh, I took pride as a staff member thinking about a museum as being an educational space. But I think with the pandemic and everything that's going on, it has been viewed more as a community space. We are not just the voice of the community, but we are there to support the community. You know, so when we talk about the Chinese American history at the museum, we have to talk about not just what happened, but why it happened. You know, when we, when we talk about 1882, we talk about Chinese exclusion, but well, what led to Chinese exclusion? You know, when we talk about Dennis Kearney, the Chinese must go as a dangerous rhetoric um, that led to exclusion. Then we talk about blaming the Japanese um, for uh, Detroit auto workers. And then we have the killing of Bissi Chen. And currently now with the pandemic of, you know, the Kung flu and all this other dangerous rhetoric, we see that dangerous rhetoric can lead to violence. And as a museum, as we witness it going, as happening, I think we have to take a more proactive approach and think about um, not just part of history, but bringing it to current events. And I think that's something that as the Chinese American Museum and as the staff, we've been trying to figure out a narrative and then how we are able to support the community, the Chinese American community, but also provide a lot of unity for other uh, VIPLC, because it's not a unique, you know, aspects to our community. Every community is facing this. Yeah, I wanted to add to Nancy's point about urgency, because I think our models never really functioned on behalf of the communities or the, the people that we serve. I mean, most museums are not agile. They're not able to be responsive to news that changes in 24 hours. They're not able to answer the questions maybe that or, or to build a network of support for those individuals that are looking for, you know, where can I go and actually hear concrete facts because I'm getting a lot of misinformation. Where can I go to be supported? And I think that that actually means, and I agree, Nancy, we have a lot of work to do because our methodologies are broken. We don't engage those members of the community and of, of the history that we need to so that they're a part of that conversation. I think Tang's model is a great one, but that's something new. How do we go into these existing institutions? And I would even say, go out of institutions that don't even deal with culture, science, American history. They're all telling the story from a biased colonial way going back to you know, um, Jack's point at the beginning. So we have tremendous work to do. And I keep thinking, how do we just create a new model that doesn't take 10 or 20 years to renovate or to redo or to recurate, but really kind of have layering and lenses of which we can bring new interpretation to objects and things that are already there by bringing more people into the conversation. Jack, how would you respond to that? Because I think that's a great yeah, point about, uh, you know, we have these existing institutions and, you know, how can we not reinvent the wheel but sort of add on to what, what people are. Uh, this is a really tough one because I really believe in museum spaces and museum collections and, and having uh, actual places, especially in a place like New York where the Chinese American experience was basically invisibilized, Chinatown was well known, Restaurants are well known, all those things are well known, but the actual history is pretty much invisibilized. Um, so the museum really has an important role of physically being there. At the same time, it's just so expensive. You know, it's just so difficult and a permanent exhibit is so expensive and it takes years and years to do. So how can, uh, how can we think of maybe um, the, the role of museums 
as being as being reinvented as agile spaces um, that can help facilitate dialogue, can help be trusted places to gain um, reliable uh, histories. Um, how can they be places in which we're engaging with the complex communities that are there? Um, Chinatown was never strictly Chinese. It was always a mixture of downtown port culture groups that were coming in and out. Uh, the very early African-American community of the city was there before it got driven out of the downtown area. Um, the early churches had slave galleries in which the slaves were supposed to sit uh, in the high back area and the, the, um, their masters were sitting in the paid uh, pews in the front. And we still have those churches. So there's, um, there's amazing dialogues that can happen that speak directly to today uh, in some ways, it requires us to um, uh, be agile and to be in cross group dialogues um, to, to really then uh, adjust the framing um, that we're also having, because in some ways, by focusing on one group's history or another, which is the, the logic of how our institutions are, are set up, it also creates boundaries where it's more difficult to actually talk across across groups. One of my favorite exhibits that had been done by um, Herb and the team uh, was really the one around food, which I thought opened up the door to have that kind of cross-cultural discussion, but also um, food um, can be trite because I know I, you know, I grew up with grade school reports having to be the one Chinese kid and talking about Chinese food and chopsticks and all that. So I'm not advocating that, but um, there are ways in which I think we can be agile in creating spaces that then bring people together and to, and, and to really listen and build those relationships across groups, which seems to me to be paramount right now. If, if I can interject to, or, um, to, to Jack's point, um, one way to consider is also think about who, who might be non-museum partners that we could talk to. Um, I'll, I'll use an example where Ted Gong um, joined me at a panel at the Anacostia Community Museums back in December 2019. Um, it's the um, Museum for the People Symposium. And we had a session on how to um, think about museum from outside the field. And one of our panelists was actually a, a therapist from a local LGBTQ clinic in Washington, DC, Whitman Walker Clinic. And she was describing um, one of her first patients um, that she met who um, you know, I'm not going to go into the details of him, but um, one of he was experiencing homelessness and um, how he spent his day was a lot of time was at one of the free museums at the Smithsonian the National Gallery of Art in DC and also spending the evening at the millennial stage at the Kennedy Center, which every day there's a 30 minute show um, for free for anyone to, to go, you know, partake. And she asked him, why do you go to museums? And the answer was, um, so that I don't have to be alone. And um, so the panelists turned to the audience and she said, you know, as a therapist, I don't know if you know, but um, loneliness is one of the major epidemics in this country. And whether you know it or not, museums already are doing part of their work by being that place for people to connect. But if you actually bring more intention to that and work with us where we actually work with people who might need connection, but they never know how to get to museums or know that museum is a resource, we can work together and make the impact more intentional and more concrete. So just an example of how, you know, thinking about partnership in a different way could also be helpful. Yeah, I actually want to maybe stay on that a little bit longer. Um, some of your ideas about community sort of connectedness and how museums can be part of that um, equation. Um, and I wonder if people have thoughts about, uh, about that. Um, I think in our earlier call, like our prep call, we were talking about how museums could serve as places to help people deal with trauma even. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting kind of sort of very provocative um, idea, you know. Um, yeah, actually, do you want to say more about that? And I'm curious if, if other panelists have kind of, um, you know, responses to, to 
that kind of role for, for museums in their communities? For the question of this museum is trauma prepared? Yeah. So just the backstory of that is at the same panel that we were having conversation about how to reimagine museums. Another panelist is from DC Public Libraries. And the, her funny quote, which is not quite funny when you think deeply about it, she said, sometimes at public libraries, we have to remind ourselves that we are also about books. Because a lot of time, I think public libraries have evolved so much that they are becoming more and more of a community center than just a place for books. And she said that nowadays when they recruit for people to work at, at the libraries, they also recruit from you know, people, people with social workers uh, uh, degrees or psychology degrees because the frontline workers that meet with people who walk into that space are actually providing service and are the first connection and if, if the space is tr truly open for all, as the mission or the intention is asking for, then people might be walking in with all different issues and challenges and, and might come with trauma. So the question is, are the staff members trauma prepared and trained to respond to the people that they want to serve? How do we remain healthy and also help with the, the need of the people that, that we are working with. So, so that's what the genesis of the question of, you know, uh, how do we, she asked, you know, how do we make public libraries trauma prepare? But I think the same question could also apply for um, museums as well. So what, curious about what authors think about that. I, I agree with you um, wholeheartedly be you know, I, I see sometimes there's not that much difference in terms of people's perceptions when they come in about what the services are, what the content is, what the mission of the entity is. And I think it's really, really dangerous if we go into a space where we're not fully trained. Um, and also it's just, you know, I use this example, sometimes a lot of people assume if you're from Taiwan or you're Taiwanese that you understand the cross-strait relationship. And it's the same assumption as if you're Chinese and you should know Kung Fu. I mean, these are all very similar assumptions that we make based on our perceptions. So I think subjectivity in this way is, and it's really tricky because we have that fine line of being a museum that talks about oral histories. So sometimes oral histories being, you know, from one's personal viewpoint um, and from one, one's own experience is naturally subjective and anecdotal. Um, and yet, how do you refine that into um, space that then also creates an objectivity and that learnedness and that expertise um, without overstepping or um, under delivering. And, and I feel like all of that has to be really, really crystallized to make sure that what we're offering isn't, isn't disingenuous um, and, and is also is, is, is founded in, in, in proper training, as you suggest. Yeah, I saw it really, I was really honored to participate in an autism training for one of my clients and the security guards you know some of them had children who were or family members and they were some of the biggest advocates and leaders and I mean they had to be really sensitive about the training they had to prepare ahead of time and turn certain exhibits on and off but what it taught me is that you know, even the staff that you don't think of as being interpretive or, you know, um, can really help a great deal. And they notice, they notice when people are uncomfortable, they notice when someone might be emotional. And so, again, it kind of thinks about the roles that, you know, we create in these institutions a little bit differently. Um, in the early days of the New York Chinatown History Project, when we decided to focus on Chinese laundry workers on the East Coast, um, it, you know, the eight to 10, 15,000 Chinese laundries in the metro region, it became clear as we started talking to people and as they started uh, as families, the children who grew up in the back of laundry started talking that these were families that had to grow up and uh, somehow managed to find a living uh, as a consequence uh, of Chinese exclusion. Uh, so that in effect, um, laundries could be understood as, a, as, as, um, as really a very confined alienating experience 
of and by itself. So, so in some ways, as we were talking to the the, um, the fathers, the mothers, the children, it became clear that there was um, cross generational stigma, but also cross generational trauma of, of the exclusion experience itself. So, I think we necessarily, in just um, trying to be there to listen to them, also were there um, working with them. I mean. The, one of the first calls we got was of a of a laundry in the South Bronx where the where the father had been killed in the laundry had been shot in the laundry, and the the family decided to close up the laundry and then donate the the items that they had of the laundry you know scores of years of of their family story living in the back of the laundry also to donate it to um, the project. Um, and it became clear that um, the Chinese American experience of that earlier period was deeply traumatic. And we couldn't just treat this as academic historians. Uh, none of us were really. Um, and to really just have as full of an understanding of what that experience was about. Um, so in some ways, I think the community that we're trying to document really taught us that. And um, uh, we learned a tremendous amount you know, from that process. So in some ways, um, uh, we have to also then learn and work with um, the parts of the community that do deal with uh, trauma uh, in a professional way. And, and how do we partner with those folks? How do we deal with alienation? You know, those kinds of questions. Um, yeah, I, I see Nancy's walking around. I'm, I'm guessing you're walking towards the laundry section, Nancy. Is that what you're doing? Yeah. 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 Exactly. This is, I think, the the piece that you're talking about. Is that right? And there's, um, there's some a man images. Goes, yeah, and the eight pound iron, yeah. the cast iron, and um, we tried to on the floor, Nancy, on the floor below the iron. We tried to kind of show the yeah. wearing of the floor because the laundryman huh. would be working there for. 10, 12, 14 more hours a day standing there. And some of the laundries we visited, the floorboards, the, the linoleum would be worn through, the floorboards would be worn through, and it would just in some ways mark those, um, the, those, those hours, right, um, of, of grueling work that they have no, no choice but to, to do, right? So, yeah. To kind of um, add on to the conversation, something that we've been talking about in museum a lot is how to react to trauma that might occur in real time as well. Um, I know you know, our museum talks about a lot of dark history and, I, and we understand that people may walk in with certain trauma, but we also need to understand that there is a lot happening right now in the moment. And our um, staff has started training to um, help intervene and be, um, be a good bystander. So in case something does happen in the museum, when we do open up to the public, um, you know, we can be prepared to help in that situation, um, you know, whether it's to, you know, kind of calm the situation or, or distract some way or, you know, so I think for us, we're really aware of that right now. But some things may happen in, in real time, in person. Thank you for that. Um, this is my next question before I turn it over to audience questions. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, folks, I think in the audience that are museum professionals or work in public history. And uh, wanted to ask the panelists, you know, the, the work that we do in art, culture, and history, they may, they may be seen as um, sort of indulgences by uh, folks in the immigrant communities that we serve many of whom are working class, they, you know, they're too busy maybe to go to museums, they don't, have, they don't come from um, that uh, sort of culture where museum going is a sort of leisure activity. So how do you, you know, how do you guys make these things accessible and relevant to um, people's lives in the communities that you serve? I think a lot of us have this question all the time. Nancy, would you like to? Pick that up. Yeah, sure. Um, 
you know, I think we do a lot outside of the museum. Um, so we do come back as a home base here. Um, and of course, school groups come, you know, all the time, probably 40% of our visitorship is still school groups um, from public and private, mostly tri-state area, uh, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. Uh, but what I love about the education program led by Lauren Champkin and Nora Chen is, you know, we do go out into the communities. Um, we have a very close relationship with several of the junior high schools, the elementary schools, um, and they also, we also have partnerships that bring um, some of these families that, and you know, and I, and, and you know, I, I relate to it because I, I, I'm the only museum my parents and I ever went to uh, together before they came to MoCA was in Taiwan and, you know, the, the national, uh, you know, the museum there. And it, there just wasn't a habit of that um, for me to go with my family. There, there just wasn't enough disposable income, right? Um, and um, so what we want to do really is, you know, emissions revenue from our total revenue makes up less than 3%. So I don't know if uh, others have this, you know, but sometimes you do have visitors who come in and they want it to be free, right? The ultimate question is how much does anyone really want to give, you know, pay to enter a museum? And it's usually the answer is zero, um, whether it be the Met or wherever or, or MoCA. Um, so we never want, a fee or even the mindset that, that one doesn't wanna spend money to be a barrier to entry. So I think that's something that we wanna make sure that we welcome. So in fact, MOCA actually for several years now has been uh, you know, complimentary mission for anyone living in this general area. So Lower East Side, Two Bridges, Chinatown. Um, and also that you know, we disseminate that information through the schools. Um, and also uh, New York Chinese Cultural Center, which is a dance instruction space. A lot of those families are recent immigrants. Um, they do everything bilingually. So actually they were using our space for all their dance classes, which we're really excited about. Um, so they had you know, well over a couple of hundred students in our space every, um, every week. And so those parents would just, you know, we encourage them to enjoy the space, enjoy the museum, of course, it was complimentary. Uh, but doing those types of partnerships, and now United East is going to be sharing space with us and having people come into this space where they might be here for another reason, but then they get to also experience MOCA is something that we really try to sort of, you know, harness that kind of partnership so people are coming into the space and creating a little bit more comfort because they're used to some other activity, but it's within the museum space. And then it's sort of, sometimes it's baby steps and sometimes it's leaps in leaps and bounds. Yeah, I think at the museum, the Chinese American Museum, you know, when we think about um, a museum, we're trying to think about beyond our galleries in terms of space uses. So we actually partner with uh, a local mall in Los Angeles, and we actually um, created uh, several murals on the storefronts to celebrate or to talk about the Chinese American experience. We also work with Grand Park uh, locally to really bring in uh, art to the, uh, that community. So we're trying to think about partnerships as necessary is really key for our survival and to really spread our mission and thinking about the museum as not just a location based now, but is mission driven of making sure we're able to share the Chinese American experience everywhere and anywhere, regardless if it's in our galleries or whatnot. Um, we're also aware that, you know, when we do our, or when we do our history, that as a museum, we, we're here to elevate the stories and we have to really think about who we elevate and how we elevate the stories and how we present the stories. So we make sure that when we select an artist, that, you know, whether or not they're the API or whatnot, but they're able to have a compelling story that the visitors are able to connect with them. Because when we talk about, you know, immigrant stories and you having someone else who's not from the community, you know, making the art, there's nuances that people won't get, right? Because it should maybe be based on the traditional European model of art. But if we have our own artists and our own community creating art, there's a hope the fact that, you know, our community are able to really look at it, appreciate and understand, you know, certain imagery, certain metaphors that are as part of our own culture and our own community. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, Jack, you have thoughts on this? I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, um, this whole question of communities and well-being is so important. Um, so I'm glad, Tang, you were bringing that up. And I, I think it's really, in some ways, museums can be spaces wherever they are that uh, are creating community, uh, 
across groups that maybe have never identified with each other or never thought of being a part of a community. And, and in that process of creating community, it's actually breaking that alienation, breaking that isolation, breaking that fragmentation that actually helps to promote well-being. Um, in looking at some of the studies about um, people who've been traumatized from the Holocaust, but also from enslavement, um, and this would go, go across generations and affect, be kind of uh, embodied so that the generational trauma has actually become part, part of how they carry themselves and part of the body memory. Um, so the, the question about well-being is so deep and um, not something that could be easily dealt with, but clearly by becoming a part of a community, um, even if it's just for a short period of time, the possibility of kind of breaking that alienation and connecting in some way and being able to speak or be a part of something is so important for well-being. So I guess I'm thinking that, you know, part of what's important. Um, so there are some studies are talking that are talking about um, the generations after those family members who had been a part of the a Holocaust or part of enslavement and what happens in the subsequent generations that are carrying that trauma on in some way, but they don't even know what the trauma is necessarily, that there are people who are now talking about the importance of post memory um, in which oftentimes it's the creativity of storytelling or of dancing or painting or whatever, that's so important to work through once the trauma is surfaced to work through um, some kind of creative transformation that helps the younger people in that same family. So something about all that um, seems to me critical for us to also have people understand the value of these kinds of discussions um, uh, and the value being caught between cross-cultural context in which um, the, the, the psychology of how to deal with trauma in a, in a Cantonese context or a Taiwanese context may be very different than the US context, which is a lot about you know, expression and talk and you, know, you go see a therapist and that kind of thing, which may not be the way to do that. Oftentimes it's over food, right? <laughs> go, going back to food or, or some kind of, um, you know, so, some other way of handling it. So what, what's the cross-cultural ways in which we can come up with well-being that actually help the family members who may be coming from very different kind of cultural systems as well? I don't know if I, could, I just want to add something on that, Jack, because we were working with the Illinois Holocaust Museum, which is primarily visited by Chicago middle school students, and they're primarily African-American, and there's just a total disconnect they don't see the connection to their personal story. And so we worked with the spoken word artist in Chicago who then interviewed the Holocaust survivors and the Holocaust survivors were even confused why we had this, what they considered a hip hop artist to meet with them. But the narrative that he wove was so beautiful. And when they heard it, they said, he totally gets it. Mm -hmm. And when the kids come in to see someone who looks like them, who's a contemporary, who's talking about um, you know, the same anguish, but a different context, then they can really see that upstander narrative. And so I, I think it is, you know, the thing that we have to battle is the big city, small city, the, you know, the, the silos. And, and this is where we have the opportunity in cultural institutions to show the other, to put people in other people's shoes. And I think that's why you know, museums can make a difference, you know, even in the smallest communities. And even if it's just an adjunct to a performance area, um, you know, we can see it. And sometimes it's the only way a young person might see someone that doesn't look like them. Yeah, I'd also like to add as well, you know, um, especially during COVID, I think, you know, not having our museum exhibitions to be able to be walked into and viewed, we really had to think of ways to, um, to connect to the community. And one of the ways to do that, of course, is with programming. So, you know, to when you think about this question about art as indulgences, you know, how can we make it more digestible for people? 
and for the audience. And with our programming, it's that's one of the ways, you know, you can have those open discussions, you can make it very relatable. Um, you can bring the artists more to life if you have them in person and you can listen to them and you can hear from them and you can hear what inspires them. And so, you know, one of the programs that we just recently did was um, for our online exhibition, we had our Year of the Ops online exhibition, we did an artist showdown. And, you know, it wasn't supposed to be anything like profound or, you know, anything like that. It was just supposed to be something really fun, but it was also a way to get to know the artists and to, to have the community see themselves reflected in the types of artists that we deliberately choose to um, showcase as a museum. Thank you for that, Rochelle. Um, and to all the panelists, thank you for taking my questions. I want to turn it over to some audience questions. We may only have time for one or two. So let me get to it. Um, the first one is from Ted, I believe, who asks, um, as you know, Congresswoman Grace Mung has been requesting congressional funding to study the creation of a national ATA museum. Since it is at least some years away from that goal, what do you think is the best use of congressional funding for the time being for existing Chinese slash Asian American museums and Chinese historical societies across the nation? Yeah, what do you think is the best use of federal funding for, for the kind of work that we do? Uh, I'll go first. <laughs> um, you know, every time I go to the West Coast and especially go through the countryside and realize that there are individuals who've been collecting objects from railroad, gold mining, whatever. And also in the Northeast, I realize that there are a lot of people who've just been collecting stuff. Um, I worry about all that stuff a great deal. It, and I, I'm also so aware of people just tossing out things, um, children, grandchildren, not realizing the value of letters or objects, just tossing it out. Um, that's the, that's part of the dumpster diving story. Um, so, you know, I, I'm worried that all, so much of this stuff is just being lost and there's no place to put it. Um, so that's one, one really deep concern I have. Um, the other one is that, you know, I think we can do so much through our smart devices and that's an important way to kind of build um, build history, build solidarity, build connections. Um, the worry, of course, that we have in building a central museum in DC is that that's going to soak up all the money that, um, that the regional and local museums also need to survive. And there has to be a way to solve that problem uh, so that there's some mutual synergy happening as opposed to um, everybody looking to donate to the most prestigious site um, and, and therefore draining the possibility of, of um, the, the many institutions that are represented in the audience and, and here on the panel from surviving. So. Um, Nancy, do you have awesome question of what to do with all this money, yeah. uh, federal money? <laughs> You know, the first time, and again, just always in transparency and, and my honest opinions about things, when, when I heard that um, Congresswoman Meng was thinking about this, you know, this was several years ago, um, I really paused and I said, I, I get it. Um, but at the same time, it seems like it is following just this, um, the easy thread, if you will. Um, and I think there are moments in history that really, if they are properly recorded um, in books and textbooks, in a building, in an institution, um, that they will open up the narrative for many, many others. And in that way, I think um, the situation around Japanese internment, um, Chinese exclusion and its aftermath, um, these, are, these are very important um, you know, markers in US history, obviously, and, and the things that we already do know about um, much more readily, but those two in terms of the AAPI experience um, are fundamental to really understanding and, and helping to broaden out the narrative for other groups. So in, in my sense, and I, and I hope I'm still objective about it, but that's one reason why I'm at MOCA is I do feel that there needs to be more of a, um, you know, a, a Chinese American museum that, that, that can, um, and a consortium um, like this one 
um, like the ones um, that that you know Hoytia I was trying to do a couple years ago, and that that's important. I do think that whichever we need to hold each other accountable. So the funding part is a big deal, uh, but holding each other accountable, and, and we've talked about this in Herb and I brainstormed and others on this call when we hosted the gathering. It's just as how can we be more um, thoughtful about, um, okay, we have an exhibit, um, it can travel, and let's just have it travel to Chicago, to John Day, to, you know, to Houston, to, to LA, wherever, it may, maybe LA has one, and let's travel to New York, and then the expenses are really just around shipping. Um, and to be really transparent about a model that um, really benefits one another in a spoke type of way, um, whether there be um, some, some hubs, um, in in the sort of major cities, and then spokes around to support this, you know, the the smaller ones are trying to grow. But I think that that's a really important model for um, Chinese America. Um, so yeah, definitely AAPI. I would think because we're just having such a hard time thinking about the new Mocha is that that research and that scholarship is going to take decades um, to get an AAPI a um, museum on the lawn done well, and there's also no space on the lawn. And also my whole also leaning is that, you know, if you're in a Chinatown somewhere, the food's a lot better. And the experience is like, you're actually rolling out into a living, breathing, you know, conversation with, um, with, with the, you know, the, the neighborhood. Happy. Um... Saidal, any thoughts on this question? Yeah, um, you know, I'm sitting here just really thinking about this difference between like a localized history and a nationalized history and what we can do to bring in similarities of localized history into a larger American narrative. You know, I think that that's one thing that's really missing and the funding can be used to really perhaps making sure that our history is included in the textbooks and perhaps funding localized uh, museums to create curriculum based on localized history and then um, creating a network to really spread it out to the nation. Because I think what's important is like, you know, we know um, there's a Chinese Chinatown in Los Angeles in New York, you know, DC and whatnot, but there's so many Chinese American communities in the Midwest and you know, in the South that aren't discussed and aren't incorporated into our larger narrative. And if we understand that, you know, this Chinese American experience is an American experience since the 1800s and that's taught within, you know, the classrooms, then I think that our voices would be heard and we won't be continue to be facing this discriminatory legislation or anti-Asian hate or any of these aspects with this, you know, key understanding that our legacy has been here since, you know, the construction of America, and especially the construction of California. Thank you, Michael. Um, Fidel, do you have uh, thoughts on this question of what to do with federal money? Yeah. Yeah, I know, yeah, I know we're getting tight on time, but I, I, I think that part of the problem, and I'll go to Jack's point about George Washington, part of the problem is when we do these museums that are only about one group, we see masses of that group go to that, which isn't bad because it's pride. So in some ways, you know, we wanna have a women's museum and a Hispanic museum, an Asian Pacific museum, but there's only so much space. You know, I would love to see money put so that when you know, Mount Vernon is redoing their exhibit on George Washington. There's things about what was happening for the Asian, the early Asian population and perceptions because those people might not go to, you know, the, the African-American museum on the mall or an Asian Pacific museum. So I feel like when we separate, the problem is we're not actually reaching the people that we that we also want to be reaching. So it is a tricky thing of pride and heritage for those who want to see themselves represented, you know, in a way that's meaningful in those collections. But I think it has to be some sort of hybrid so that we're really educating and putting money in, in local history museums so that those stories are told there where those kids are going. Because we know a lot of people make a pilgrimage to DC, but that's a, you know, a small percentage of the broader population. Thank you, Sadal. And Rochelle, I'm going to give you the last one on this uh, question. What would you do with a million books? 
to help <laughs> to help our going back to tongue Trump. Really. Yeah, I would I would mostly echo you know most of the sentiments that everyone had previously said. Um, but you know to to what Sabelle was saying, I I think that is really a good point because you know separating separating the different heritages into different spaces, um, you know, might not be the best way. I think putting the money back into the local organizations where um, they really know the history and they can really dive deeper into it and um, educate those people in that community and people that visit the community. Um, and as mentioned as well, you know, I come, I come from a community where we didn't take that pilgrimage to DC when I was in eighth grade. Um, you know, there was no funding for that. So would that really serve the greater nation as well? You know, it's so, it's it's hard to say, but I I would probably lean more towards the um, the smaller museums. Yeah. Great, thanks so much, uh, Michelle. And um, with that, I think I'm gonna, we're at time, let's close the, the round table discussion. Uh, there's a lot more to discuss and I think, um, you know, but I thought this was a really rich discussion. So we really want to thank Nancy, um, Fidel, Rochelle, Michael, and Jack, and Tong, of course, for um, you know, uh, sort of giving us this wonderful prompt um, to to talk through. Um, uh, and also thanks to all the audience who who joined today. Um, you know, sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions, but it was great to be in conversation with you all. And with that, I'm going to pass it over now to um, Hong Yan for, uh, for the final sort of goodbyes. Hong Yan. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the foundation, I just want to once again extend our appreciation to all the panelists for forming such a robust and stimulating conversation. Uh, I would like to close, close out today's session with an overview of tomorrow's session two. Uh, same time, we'll discuss uh, some of the innovations in design, education, research, and outreach that really put the concept of community-centric design into practice. Uh, so there will be leading members of museums and preservation communities um, to join to discuss their ideas, approaches uh, for creating space that uh, uplift communities, um, help us to remember, honor, heal, and to look into the future and build towards social justice. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow, hopefully. Bye. Thank you.